continue, if I can have your attention, we're back, we're back streaming live here from the LaSalle Stewart Center. Thank you all. I love to see all of the chatting, the peer-to-peer -peer conversation and sharing is terrific. So we're going to continue to hear about how our landscapes are, are having conversations out there. And we're going to do that by hearing about how wildlife perceive their landscapes. And I'm sure they're talking to each other and to their landscapes too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Juliana Jenkins is a postdoctorate uh, student. No, yes. You're just postdoc. She's not a student. She's a, just a straight up postdoc who is currently working with the PNW Research Station. Please help me welcome Juliana. Thank you. So Cheryl asked me today to talk about um, how wildlife perceive landscapes. And um, when she asked me this, I thought, oh, that'd be, that shouldn't be too bad. Um, but the more I got thinking about it, and as I'm sure you all realize, um, the short answer to this question is, it depends. <laughs> um, it really depends upon what species you're actually interested in studying. Um, if, you know, think about their physical size, the mobility of your species, whether um, your species is a, is a bird or a large mammal or an amphibian, um, <clears throat> what their breeding strategies are, how much they, um, they move, so what's their dispersal patterns. Uh, like Didi was saying, habitat is not just um, breeding habitat. It is involved with dispersal, it's involved with um, wintering. Maybe their requirements are different in the winter than in the summer. So we have to think about all of those, that big combination of things when we're talking about wildlife and landscapes. Um, so my research specialty is um, quantitative uh, wildlife population monitoring and, um, and modeling, and identifying what vegetation conditions are most closely associated with, um, with a certain species in a particular time period. So it's a really fine scale um, modeling that I like to do. But for today, I thought I would instead um, talk about kind of a, or give an overview of a basic wildlife 101. Let's go back to college and just make sure we're starting on the same page, okay? A little, little lightness here after our break uh, to get us warmed up for really intense conversations later. Um, let's see if I can figure out this guy. So that being said, um, oops, that's backwards, here's forwards. So I'm going to talk about three key considerations when managing wildlife on a landscape scale. And again, I'm going to talk a lot about, I'm going to be speaking mostly in generalities um, and just be, be aware of that. There are specifics. Um, considerations for individual species, and we all know that. So since we have such diverse representation here, we're going to just stick with the basics for right now. Um, so we're going to talk about the importance of, of identifying scales of interest for your particular species, um, then identifying their habitat requirements and limiting factors um, necessary to that species. And then also we're going to talk about effects of fragmentation and edge and what considerations you need to think about um, for your individual species. So just to start out with here, um, first consideration, um, really have to ask the question of at what scale does your species operate? To understand how our management of the environment affects them, we need to identify, identify not just spatial scales and not just our anthropomorphic scale. Um, we, we typically consider la land management actions as humans, right? Um, but uh, a clear cut is not going to look the same to, say, a snail whose whole life, um, life experience might be a couple weeks long over a, a couple square um, meters compared to that of a, um, of a very um, mobile animal such as a migratory bird who might utilize a vast range of resources and different cover patches, um, utilize a lot of heterogeneity in their habitat. Um, so these are, that's the first primary consideration we're going to think about in wildlife uh, management. Uh, so just an example of some species that, this is a, a species, a spotted skunk that it's a very small animal. It's um, you know smaller than a cat. It's uh, we have a, gr a graduate student, Marie Tosa, um, who's done a radio telemetry study on these skunks in the H.G. Andrews experimental forest over the last three years. She just wrapped up her field work, um, and she's found that these animals actually tra traverse for such a small animal, they move huge distances within their annual um, within their home range. So that they can have home ranges upwards of 2,000 hectares. This is bigger home ranges than a spotted owl. Um, so just keep in mind that even sometimes our assumptions of what, what space animals need are kind of flawed. Uh, counter that 
this big, this small animal with a huge range, compare that to, say, a red retrieval and their um, scale of experience. Uh, red retrievals are really um, spend their entire life within um, 50 to 200 meters of where they were born. They're very, they can move very quickly, but they really don't like to move much. Um, their primary food source is the, are the, um, the resin ducts within fur needles. So they spend the majority of their time uh, moving between uh, two to four trees. Um, the really important components for them are the interconnectivity of branches within that area. Um, so very small animal, very small um, scale of consideration for this species. Um, similar to some of the species that Didi was talking about, right? The second consideration that we need to focus on when we're thinking about wildlife and uh, landscape is we actually have, we have to define their habitat requirements, and all habitat requirements are super species specific, right? Um, identify their limiting factors um, and recognize that habitat requirements are super variable um, depending upon the time of year, depending upon um, even the sex of the species, females versus males. So um, habitat considerations are very, species specific again. Um, so it depends on what they require, right? So um, since there's such a range of habitat requirements, I'm gonna start by just defining the differences between these three words that we use all the time in, um, in wildlife ecology. Uh, habitat versus resources versus suitable cover. And um, hopefully we'll understand that these three words, while interrelated, are represent very different things and when, we, when we speak about them in um, in terms of wildlife uh, habitat and um, landscape uh, conservation. So habitat, the definition of habitat when you're thinking about wildlife, is the sum of all necessary resources and environmental conditions for the maintenance of a species, that's required for the maintenance of a species. So this includes not only things like vegetation structures that are important um, or shelter components, it also includes things like uh, the prey abundance across the landscape. The, um, level of competition on the landscape. For example, for northern spotted owls, a new habitat component that we need to consider is the um, density of barred owls spread across the landscape. And that's not something we can really map well yet, right? But it is an essential part of their habitat uh, that we need to think about. Um, we also need to think about uh, climate, as we've seen in previous talks. And um, aspect of, of hill slopes can, can be important parts of um, habitat and how those, those that prior geology has affected the climate in the region. Um, these are all components of habitat. But as um, land managers and wildlife biologists, we're typically focused on instead identifying the, and um, defining the availability and relative importance of environmental resources, um, and which are mostly vegetation structures spread across the landscape um, that promote the quality of habitat. So when we say habitat as a wildlife biologist, I'm usually talking about resources or um, suitable cover, which I'll define in the next couple slides here. So for um, the definition of a resource, which we often, again, use interchangeably as habitat, um, is matter taken up by a species. So for example, food items. It can be a, um, objects associated with the species or associated closely with that species during a particular life stage, often objects like um, we can think of uh, resting structures, like this down log for um, spotted skunks. We can think of specific types of trees for, required for nesting. Um, you know, for, I'm a spotted owl biologist right now, so often I think of you know, old growth, large mature trees, broken top trees, those kinds of resources. Um, we can also think about um, conditions that influence the use of a location um, by a species. And can, these conditions are the most kind of important resource that we use right now because they are what we map. We can, we can actually map and change their um, distribution across the landscape using uh, management actions. <coughs> um, let's see if I can also want to say here. Nope. So again, so habitat is different than resources. and. Um, but using those resources, we develop suitable cover maps or habitat capable maps. And if you guys are given a habitat map of your region, that's likely a suitable, uh, suitable cover map for a species, right? This is, these are areas that have the combination of vegetative resources required by, by a species. Um, well, at least usually vegetative resources when we're thinking of um, birds and large mammals. 
for amphibians, um, suitable cover maps might be more focused on climate or moisture ranges, right, moisture conditions. Um, it's another point I wanted to make here, just to kind of hammer home, that suitable cover does not exactly translate to habitat because we are ignoring factors such as prey diversity um, or prey availability, uh, competition, and often a lot of the resources that we know are important for species, we don't have suitable maps for um, in order to develop these cover maps. So that being said, I just want to briefly kind of walk through um, how we develop cover maps um, so you can have a better idea of where these, are, where these maps are coming from. Um, we first use uh, expert knowledge to select a list of resource conditions that we know are important to a species. And these are often Arc ArcGIS layers, right? Um, relative density of trees or um, distance, to, distance to roads, those sorts of layers. And it, oftentimes, we, again, we don't have suitable um, maps for some of these resources. So the, the cover maps that we produce are only as good as our current ability to map these conditions. So after we get those, uh, that list of resources, we train and test spatial resource selection models using actual um, locations of, um, of the animal of interest, species of interest. And these are statistical models that output an initial um, resource selection probability surface map, similar to this red to blue um, map there in the corner. Um, <coughs> and then again, after we have this map, um, experts in the field or wildlife ecologists make uh, some delineation of what, um, some cutoff of what is suitable and what is unsuitable for your individual species. And um, that's what we then give to everyone else to kind of think about um, patch, the patchwork landscape of habitat. And I guess one more emphasis here, these maps are reimagined re, uh, re every few years and they improve drastically as we in improve our understanding of, um, of what resources wildlife need and also um, as we improve our spatial um, mapping systems. So from, from one iteration to the next, you might see great differences in, in the suitable cover maps, even though there's not been a lot of change on the landscape. And the reason is we're just getting more and more information with, into these maps. Um, so as an example of a map you'll probably see a lot in Oregon and Washington is the uh, Northern Spotted Owl um, cover maps for nesting and roosting. <coughs> this is a subset of um, the um, Gifford Pinchot National Forest. And you can see the darkest polygons here are representative of um, suitable nesting and roosting cover for Northern Spotted Owls. Um, when the Lighter green is foraging suitable cover for spotted owls, and the light green is dispersal suitable cover for northern spotted owls. And spotted owls, we have 30 years of data on these birds, so we know a lot about what they require for their resources. So for this species, we're able to get these really detailed um, cover maps. Whereas compare that to the um, cover type mapping for the marble murrelet, which is produced, um, sorry, that last map was produced by Ray Davis, and the marble murrelet, um, cover type mapping is produced by Rafael et al. in, 19, in 2016. So one difference between marble murrelets and northern spotted owl cover type maps is that marble murrelets, since they spend so much of their lifetime in the sea, and they actually, you know, they fly and forage um, every day to the ocean and back to their nest sites, um, one of the major resources we consider when developing these maps is actually a suitable commute distance to the ocean. So resource conditions, um, what, what you define a resource is really variable and depending upon that species. So distance to ocean is a significant resource for marble murrelet, where it's not so significant for other species. Um, all right, so a final, finally, consideration number three, which I wanted to talk about, is um, when, planning, when planning management actions, we need to consider how our actions will contribute to the fragmentation of cover and the amount of edge conditions present at the landscape scale. And for wildlife habitat, we can think of a patch as, say, a suitable cover patch. So now that we have these maps, we can see how these patches are arrayed on the landscape <coughs> and how they build up into small, larger and larger scales. Um, so a simplistic definition of fragmentation is the process where large patches of habitat or um, suitable cover in our, in our, um, in our framework 
uh, is broken up into smaller patches which become increasingly isolated. And an important consideration here is that not every species, again, considers um, fragmentation, is gonna, is gonna consider fragmentation the same way. Um, to us, so if we look at these two maps at the bottom here, on the, on the left is a typical kind of ONC landscape where you have a clear cut square next to a for, um, preserved square, mature forest. This looks like pretty intensive fragmentation to my eyes as a, as a human or as a large mammal. <laughs> Compare that to the um, level of fragmentation on the, in the other side there. Um, and that's a uniform thinning that took place, I think, in southern Oregon somewhere, um, where the canopy cover overall is pretty, pretty well maintained. There's still a high percentage of canopy cover, but the individual connectivity between trees has been drastically reduced. So if you're looking from the perspective of a red tree vole, they might consider the, um, the thinning a more significant or higher level of fragmentation than say the ONC landscape where they can still traverse between those uh, corners of those um, remaining squares. So again, scale is also important. And again, I'm just gonna repeat, scale is important when you're considering about, when you're thinking about different animals. Um, general wildlife impacts of fragmentation, uh, to take you all back to, again, your first wildlife ecology class. Um, generally, as fragmentation increases, you increase the number of generalist species on the landscape, and you increase the amount of edge habitat on the landscape. You also increase the number of exotics and um, novel predators present within those interior um, habitats. And you, in contrast to that, you decrease the amount of interior habitat you um, increase, you decrease the dispersal ability for many interior forest specialists, and you decrease the richness of interior species. So as patches get smaller, you generally have fewer species able to survive in those patches. Um, another basic kind of definition, um, just to remind everybody, an edge is just a boundary between two different patches of cover or two different patches of habitat. And the um, extent of a negative, any negative effects of edge really depends upon the contrast between those two patches. If we look at this edge boundary here between, say, an old growth patch of forest um, and a regenerating mature fo uh, forest patch, the differences, at least to our eyes, are not very significant. So we can expect potentially smaller effects here compared to um, this situation where we have an old growth patch directly next to a recent harvest patch. Um, where the, um, the extent of, say, drying into the old growth forest will be much longer, much larger. Um, some of these negative effects um, include a change in biotic conditions within uh, a certain distance of that edge, so a loss of moisture, you can have an increase in blowdowns, um, you're just able to get more weather kind of into that patch. You also have a change in biotic interactions um, common at these edge areas. Um, the most famous example is an increase in nest predators um, at harsh edges um, for forest songbirds up to like 100 meters into the forest. And you can also, edges can also operate as uh, barriers, barriers to dispersal depending upon the species you're thinking of. Um, a very kind of simplistic example would be if you think about the um, dispersal proclivities of spotted owls versus northern goshawks. Spotted owls really prefer to travel under some sort of canopy layer, whereas northern goshawks um, are pretty comfortable flying under the canopy and above the canopy. So this barrier might not be as significant to a northern goshawk compared to a spotted owl. Um, another example of edge effects with one of our species, um, for marbled murrelets, edge effects can really, uh, we think, decrease the quality of nesting sites near edges. So, and this is due to um, microclimate changes, reducing branch suitability potentially on those trees closest to an edge, um, increased wind throw, just even eggs getting blown off of branches, um, a loss of moss. And um, another important consideration we're thinking about is this increase in populations of nest predators, particularly corvids, um, as you increase the amount of roads or um, just fragmentation in general uh, near their nesting sites. So just to kind of close, I've got four big generalities we can think about. Uh, number one, what can we do to kind of preserve some of these as land managers? Uh, number one, we can preserve existing areas of suitable cover. And we should do this strategically, thinking about landscape, overall landscape context, as Didi and um, 
others before me have talked about. But it's important to consider that a lot of these, for a lot of these animals, metapopulation dynamics are a legitimate process. And um, even if you don't find an animal on a certain patch of suitable cover this year, doesn't mean that it won't be recolonized in the next year. Um, we can also, um, in some cases, increase limiting resources where possible. For example, um, retrievals are limited, we think, by nesting sites in, um, in maturing forest. So we can add those um, to the landscape. We can um, increase snag creation and retention for woodpecker habitat. Those sorts of things where possible. Uh, we can also promote corridors and connectivity between habitat patches, as you've heard a lot of today already um, from Didi and others. Um, and what connectivity looks like for different species varies, but generally to the more connectivity you can put on the landscape, the more species can take advantage of it is kind of a, a basic rule. And finally, we can strategically design treatments to minimize um, edge effects within interior forest areas. Um, so round or square has, has less edge area compared to a kind of amorphous shaped treatment. Um, but again, this also depends upon, this is a simplistic representation, it's gonna also depend upon the topography of your area and other considerations. Um, but with that, I think that's all I have. So very basic review of Wildlife 101, so thank you. <laughs> Time for a question or two, or a thought from anyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm allowed. Early sterile patches. Um, what would you think about how you connect early sterile patches across landscapes? It seems a little more obvious when you're talking about mature, mm -hmm. continuous forest co cover, but what about openings? connected openings? Well, that really depends, again, on the species that you're interested in. And um, most of my talk did focus on mature forest as because that's my specialty. Um, but, you know, throughout the history of our region, as Paul um, referenced earlier, we had this really heterogeneous, heterogeneous um, patchwork of succession across the landscape. But it's important to consider how a uh, how differently anthropogenic um, changes in the landscape um, form succession kind of trends compared to, uh, to natural disturbances like fire. Um, so really, I don't have a great answer for you, Cheryl. Um, <laughs> just think about the, the historical landscapes your individual species was kind of came about in. Um, and for a lot of early successional species, that would be riparian areas, that would be um, recent clear cuts, or not clear cuts, um, uh, fires regenerating, and how those were spread across the landscape. So thinking about Paul's talk would probably be the most useful and how those historic distributions of early succession was kind of spread in the landscape. Okay. In that Thank regard. You. All right.